Buprenorphine, again, the different um, brand names. History. First developed in the UK as an injection to treat severe pain. 82, we got the sublingual product. 2000, Congress passed the DATA 2000 law, Drug Addiction Treatment Act. It allowed a qualifying physician, I'm going to define that in the next slide, to prescribe or use Schedule 3, 4, or 5 medications to treat opioid addiction or detox. Most people don't know these schedules. Schedule 1, no medical use, very high abuse potential. Heroin, quaalude, <laughs> we heard about that recently. Marijuana, marijuana is still Schedule 1. Um, I'd like to see it go to at least Schedule 2 so we can study it. Right now, it's people trying to study it, they have to jump through incredible hoops to try to uh, do any research with it. Schedule 2, definite medical use, but again, high abuse potential. Examples, oxycodone, um, Vicodin, Adderall, Vyvanse, Methadone. Methadone is a Schedule 2. With a Schedule 2, I can't call in a prescription for it. I can't fax in a prescription for it. I can't put refill on the bottom of the script. You have to have a physical paper prescription every time you want to fill a Schedule 2. Schedule 3, we're getting to it's the medical use, but less, um, less abuse potential. Buprenorphine is a Schedule 3. Testosterone is a Schedule 3. Schedule 4, lower levels, benzos, Schedule 4. Schedule 5, stuff like codeine cough syrup. Lamotyl for diarrhea is a Schedule 5 opioid, controlled substance. Before this law, treatment, like I said on the previous slide, you could only get treatment in a methadone clinic if you wanted to treat opioid addiction or to do a detox. 2002, sublingual Suboxone and Subutex was approved by the FDA, and in 2003, we actually started using it in the U.S. There are some people who will say, well, well wait a second, look what happened with methadone, they thought it wasn't going to be addictive. Look what happened with heroin, sold over the counter, they thought it wasn't going to be addictive. Oxycontin, when that first came out, they thought this is God's gift to treatment of pain, non-addictive, long-acting, and then the, again they went, oops. There are people who are saying the same thing about buprenorphine. It's only been around for a little while, we don't know that much about it. No, it's been around for over 30 years. It's been used extensively in Europe and Australia for th over 30 years to treat opioid addiction. So we have a, quite a long worldwide experience with it. Again, what's a qualifying physician? You've got to meet one or more of these criteria. I meet a few of these, but uh, I'm board certified and I've done a little more than eight hours of training, but you can do any of that and be qualified to prescribe um, buprenorphine. In addition, you've got to be able to do all of these other things. You've got to be able to refer people for necessary additional services like psychosocial therapy. Also, the very first year that you get your special Suboxone license, buprenorphine license, you're only allowed to treat 30 patients. After the first year, you have to reapply to SAMHSA and get a new certificate that now allows you to treat no more than 100 patients. If I want to give, do a pain clinic, and if I want to prescribe oxycodone or oxycontin, they can be literally lined up around the block. They were in Florida for a long time. They're cu cutting down on that, but I, I could have as many patients as I want to if I want to write for oxycodone or oxycontin. If I want to treat the problem, I can only take care of 100. If I do more than 100, I'm in trouble with the DEA, and they do come and check these things. There is a bill working its way through Congress right now, <laughs> Congress and a bill, um, that's trying to increase, to lift the limit of 100 and get nurse practitioners to be able to do it. Because there's this huge, we saw the extent of the opioid problem in this country, but a lot of people cannot get treatment because there aren't enough providers or the providers that are there are at their 100 limit. So it's a problem. And again, if we can do anything, write your congressman, get this thing passed. Common misconceptions about Suboxone. This may be one of the most important slides in this whole presentation. <clears throat> it's just trading one addiction for another. 
it's just trading one narcotic for another. Even the word narcotic, it's a dirty word, isn't it? The narcotic squad. The narcs are coming to get you. Yeah? Just saying it, it's a dirty word. So now you're just doing another narcotic. You're now hooked on Suboxone. If you're taking Suboxone, you're still dirty. There's some people going to 12-step meetings, NA meetings. If they know you're taking Suboxone, they won't allow you to speak because they say you're dirty. When I, the only requirement for membership is the desire to be clean, but they forget that. You're not really clean until you stop taking Suboxone. It's no different from methadone. We just saw one difference. Even the feds recognize that there's a difference. Methadone, Schedule 2, Suboxone, Schedule 3. That's because higher risk potential with methadone than with Suboxone. So even the feds recognize there's a difference. Once you start taking Suboxone, you'll never be able to get off. Wrong. I just saw a guy today. He was taking 8 milligrams of Suboxone twice a day. I saw him today. He's now down to 2 milligrams a day and well on his way and doing great. Did, did fine with it and on his way to being off completely. I had another guy two weeks ago, had been on a similar dose. He just finished just in time to go, uh, to move to Colorado, to Denver, to start law school. So we tapered him off of the Suboxone. So misconception, it's not true. I'm going to let you read that one. Wants to keep you on Suboxone so you keep making money off of you. You guys. I had a patient two, three years ago, a young 19-year-old kid shooting heroin, also with chronic pain. He was doing great on Suboxone, really doing fine. His mother had all of these misconceptions. She thought that Suboxone was a very bad thing. She thought that uh, he could do better by, uh, he could do okay by just seeing the psychiatrist and getting, you know, doing talk therapy and her support, at basically Minnesota model, abstinence and 12-step. She sat in my office and she looked me right in my eyeballs, and this is a quote, she said, Doctor, I believe the only reason you want him to stay on Suboxone is so you can keep making money off of him. Honest to God truth, what she said to me. I never saw him again. I don't, I don't know what happened to him.